Now, I mentioned at some length uh, China in my introduction. I did so last week also. And literally millions, millions of viewers, China is a big place, millions of people watched the clips in 24 hours, watched the clips of what I said with a collar on China last week. On one platform, Chinese Twitter, Weibo it's called, 1.6 million people watched that clip in 10 hours. God knows how many it is now. One of the people that watched it was a man that I had been remiss in not following until now. He is a truly fantastic voice. Defending China, yes, but defending the rest of the world from the consequences which could be fatal of this constant ramping up of war fever with China. His name is Daniel Dumbrell. He has massively impressed me. I think he's going to impress you. And he joins me. Now he's an independent China-based political commentator and YouTuber. Daniel, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. And I take my hat off to your work, which had uh, escaped my attention into this week, but I'm now an expert on Daniel Dumbrell. Uh, but before <laughs> we talk about you, let's talk about China. Is it just jealousy of China's success that accounts for the absolutely poisonous public print and public broadcasting atmosphere on all things to do with China? Or is it something else? Well, I think that, uh, and first of all, thanks for having me on your show. I'm a, a very big fan of what you do as well. I think jealousy plays a role in it in getting everybody on board to kind of speak out against China. But I think underneath it all, there's more important things going on. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a global order and there's a certain hegemony that's in place now that needs to be preserved. China's making a lot of inroads into global South countries with their Belt and Road Initiative and things like that. And so now all of a sudden, these countries um, have two options to deal uh, to, to work with. They don't just have one exploitative option under what a lot of people call IMF fundamentalism. Now they have two choices, and they're increasingly choose to, choosing to work with China. So that is going to displace a lot of the current world order. Um, that's going to you know, displace a lot of the current uh, corporate structures in our world as well. So I think there's a, a pretty big vested interest in kind of smacking China back down. Obviously, there's the, the currency issue as well. The U.S. has weaponized their U.S. dollar for so long that they've just basically made an incentive for a lot of people to come up with an alternative. And I think some people might be afraid that China finally took that opportunity and they're turning their they're opening up their RMB a little bit more. And they also have their digital RMB blockchain based RMB coming out as well. And uh, things don't usually work out too well for people that challenge the US dollar hegemony. So I think there's a lot of different things at play, but certainly on the ground level, getting people hyped up about saying, yes, we need to uh, smack China back down, tapping into, especially in America, uh, the culture of we're number one um, definitely helps to get people on board and kind of sell this idea to more people. Daniel, the, the way I've put it in the past is that there's a kind of hellish orchestra uh, and the conductor brings different parts of the orchestra in this hellish chorus against China. Uh, according to taste or news, developments and so on. They range from, and <laughs> there are others, from Tibet, the Falun Gong, the COVID vaccine, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, the, uh, the, the origin of COVID I meant to say, uh, China's incredible success in the Olympic Games, the Paralympic Games, how are they doing it? Is it the old East German story? Are the athletes doped? And there's innumerable causes. Uh, and of course, I omitted perhaps the most recent and most salient, uh, the issue of Muslims in, uh, in the Xinjiang province of China, the so-called Uyghur question, 
uh, a tribunal for which has been set up and has already uh, given a date for its verdict, which gives you some clue as to what the verdict might be. There's so many different uh, issues. Um, all of these issues, of course, may have some uh, element worth debating, worth arguing. Uh, I'm not, and neither are you, uh, a paid mouthpiece for China. But all of them are being cynically used, aren't they? The reason I want to speak out against this is um, the it definitely is ramping up, and it looks like they're trying to manufacture consent for something. Um, I, I think for sure the uh, the, the 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 Xinjiang uh, narrative is probably one of the most absurd items, as you mentioned. And, and if you don't mind, I'd I'd like to kind of zoom out and kind of explain what we're expected to believe, if you don't mind. Sure. So so yeah. So we are now expected to believe a narrative that. Um, we have to keep in mind is overwhelmingly funded by China's rival, the US. And they've been caught lying over and over again to attack their targets and or to accomplish their, their geopolitical goals throughout history. And so they're now um, sponsoring and expecting us to believe a story about genocide going on in Xinjiang with no mass exodus or refugee crisis. And it's a story supported by a handful of so-called concentration camp escapees who left China legally on their passports through China exit immigration. And the most famous being uh, uh, somebody named Tersene Ziawadin, who's been carted around in US government panels like it's uh, Nayira 2.0 on a Netflix special, and, and who apparently had her passport renewed while she was under arrest, uh, which is, of course, impossible. And when that hole was discovered, 4,000 people had signed a petition to get the BBC to answer as to why they uncritically pushed her story, and they refused to respond. Then when CNN republished her story, they deliberately blurred out only her passport renewal date when they put it up on screen. So obviously to cover up that gaping hole in her story rather than to address it. Now, uh, there, are, there have been people that were leaving Xinjiang illegally through Southeast Asia. They make their way into Malaysia, then they fly to Turkey and they transfer over to Syria. And the West knows these people exist. But despite trying to convince everyone that they're escaping persecution, they don't offer them refuge. And the reason is really simple. It's because they know that they really do belong to a group of radicalized people that China says exists, but they're on their way to carry out jihad fighting alongside Al Qaeda with many of their kids training in ISIS built camps. And this is verifiable by the way, there's plenty of footage of it. And they're ultimately going there to help destabilize Syria and fight against what the West considers to be a common overlapping enemy. Now, this is important. Had they been carrying out jihad in the West, killing people like they're killing in Syria and displacing people like they are with the Kurds, suddenly the whole story wouldn't be about China, um, these, these, these measures that China's taking. It would be a story of China being an exporter of terrorism, not doing enough to uh, stop it. But since that's not happening, they'll turn a blind eye to it, but they'll also uh, keep their distance from these escapees because they've learned the lesson the last time around when they've cozied up too closely with uh, Salafist jihadists willing to fight in Libya after seeing them shift to carrying out jihad in the West when they were finished with Gaddafi. So that's kind of a high level view of what we've got on the table before drilling into any specifics and to understand why people's spidey senses should have kind of already been tingling by now. Quite. Um, there's also, of course, amongst the many different parts of this orchestra, the chorus around Taiwan. Now, I, I, I pointed out to someone today something which is not widely known in uh, our public opinion here, that Taiwan itself does not consider itself to be a separate country or its people a separate people. The constitution of Taiwan describes itself as a part of China and its people as Chinese people. The false dichotomy that is being offered us is that here's this gallant, plucky little Taiwan, which is being menaced by a different country, China, and to whose aid we need to come. And if there's going to be an exchange of fire between NATO and its Quad allies uh, and China, it's going to be there over Taiwan, isn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a number of different flashpoints. So Taiwan definitely is one of those possible flashpoints. If something is instigated there, or they're pushing Taiwan to um, uh, declare independence or do anything uh, kind of uh, to try to break up the relationship uh, over here, that's certainly a flashpoint. And they've been doing that for a while. Um, and I think what you mentioned is really important. Also, that even Taiwan considers itself. A part of uh, a part of China, um, and the previous instigations were the U.S. going to the Hague and 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 making these rulings about the South China Sea uh, against China mainland, which even Taiwan was disagreeing with. Um, so I, I definitely think that that is a flashpoint. Uh, but I think there's a lot more going on on the Xinjiang side that we're not looking at as well. I mean, I, I think that um, a lot of people are focused on Taiwan and the South China Sea, but over in Xinjiang, I mean, you know, you were talking about the uh, Afghan war uh, in the beginning, the real winners of that war were the, were the military industrial complex. If you look at their stock prices from 2001 to now, how many, how much, how much has increased? If you look at where they're spending their money now, they're pouring millions and millions of dollars into think tanks to sell China threat stories, especially in regards to Xinjiang. One of those think tanks is called ASPE in, in Australia. Uh, they're funded in part by the U.S. State Department and also the military industrial counter that China threat story that they just finished manufacturing. Then the other aspect of it is ETIM is the group that claimed responsibility for a lot of the attacks that happened in Xinjiang. Not too long ago, the U.S. removed them off of the terrorist list. They said that it's because they don't exist anymore and there's no credible evidence they exist. First of all, that's not something they do. The Tamil Tigers are still on the terrorist list and they haven't existed for even longer. And now you're starting to see terrorist attacks happen along Belt and Road points in uh, outside of China. So I think uh, that is even uh, an even bigger possibility because we already see it unfolding. We saw it happen in Pakistan, uh, you know, Chinese engineers being killed um, at one of the dam projects. Um, and these apologists, a large group of apologists, all of a sudden coming out pretending that Oh, well, there was no evidence that ETIM ever existed, even though there's actual records of military generals from the U.S. in 2018 actually saying they were airstriking ETIM in Afghanistan. Now, all of a sudden, I think they're going to be a convenient tool. And this is a playbook I'm sure you're very aware that they continually use over and over again since the last Cold War funding the Mujahideen uh, to funding moderate rebels that they send into Syria. It just makes sense. They're spending, the U.S. is spending $300 million a year for the next seven years for anti-China propaganda against the Belt and Road Initiative. Why wouldn't they also use, other than soft power, hard power and these terrorist groups to also attack these points if it's something they're very familiar with and they know how to do and they've done over and over again? They do. So, but, but here, uh, here yeah. uh, is uh, a double problem uh, with it, mm -hmm. Daniel. Um, first of all, Muslims are not that popular in the world. If you took, uh, as they just did in Scotland today, uh, a poll showed uh, that in uh, nice progressive nationalist Scotland, a huge majority of the people would not be happy if a significant number of new Muslim uh, refugees and immigrants were to uh, were to be directed into Scotland. Most people have been conscientized paradoxically by the very war party that now wishes to weaponize the Uyghur issue, have been conscientized by those same war parties actually to fear and loathe Muslims. Therefore, there is a ceiling, a glass ceiling, maybe it can be broken, uh, but a ceiling on how much support you're going to generate in the Western world for the so-called plight, especially when you can provide no evidence uh, of Muslims in China. And the second problem amongst the Muslim audience is how come these people who have massacred Muslims all over the world, who don't give a toss for the fate <laughs> of Muslims in Kashmir or in Palestine. How come they're so concerned about Muslims in China? 
Yeah, I mean, the, there's a joke in China that a lot of people say that, um, you know, a lot of people in the West, they don't like China and they don't like Muslims, but they really, really care about Chinese Muslims. Um, you know, it, it, it's really remarkable how they weaponize compassion in such a way saying, no, you really need to care about this. I mean, because we've seen it over and over yeah. again. And I think that's why um, <laughs> it's uh, it, it's an effort that needs to happen from multiple angles. It's, it's not just about Xinjiang. It's about Hong Kong. It's about Taiwan. It's about Xinjiang. And all together, they just overwhelm people with these things. Now, when you use language like that, when you use la language like genocide and things like that, I think it's pretty easy to get enough people on board to say, okay, yeah, this is something we should care about, um, even though um, these are exactly the same kinds of things that has been lied about over and over again. But it is it is a bit of a paradox. And, and I have seen, because I have examined some of the people who seem to really care about what's going on in Xinjiang and, and either uh, legitimately believe the propaganda or are just pretending to believe it. And when you look through their history, History, they're saying extremely Islamophobic things five years ago, and all of a sudden they're standing up for the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. So I agree it's a paradox, but it's a paradox that does exist. These people are still coming out saying, yes, we need to, sure. we need to help save the Uyghurs. Sure. Right. There's a, it's a genocide without bodies, <coughs> without refugees, without an exodus. And when you press them, as I have uh, on this show, to define this genocide, they then switch to, well, they're not killing people, they're killing Islam, or they're killing the native customs. Having used the word genocide, of course, to imply uh, the massacre of actual human beings, but quite quickly they are forced to concede that there's no evidence at all of human beings being killed uh, beyond the terrorists that are actually in Syria and on any picture you want to look at, we're in Libya, we're even in Ngorno-Karabakh, uh, fighting for the, uh, uh, the, the Turkic side uh, in that conflict. Um, the hollow claim of genocide doesn't stand up uh, to much examination. But no, it's the, true. Yeah, it's true. The yeah, Huawei sorry. issue is another that I didn't mention that is conjured forth. Now, that has engendered actual economic sanctions against China, uh, which has led actually to quite serious economic consequences in many industries in our own country, in America and elsewhere, because Chinese parts can no longer now be uh, imported and so on. So it's multi-level, isn't it? It's economic, it's cultural, it's religious, it's political, and it's also military because we have ships sailing off the Chinese coast right now. Right. Yeah, no, it is It is all over the place. I think that the, the Huawei thing, there's uh, uh, additional elements involved in that as well, too, where um, it, it's really interesting because the U.S. is constantly saying, um, China copies everything. They need to innovate. They need to make their own stuff. When Huawei comes out with 5G first or TikTok comes out with an amazing new social app, they try to ban it. And with Huawei, I feel like um, the, the problem there is they're going to these European countries and they're saying to them, don't use Huawei. There's these back doors. We can't show you where the back doors are. We don't have any evidence of it, but there might be back doors and they're going to use it to spy on you. And this is really interesting because what they're doing is they're saying that the Chinese might do exactly what the U.S. is already doing, spying on attacks tapping Angela Merkel's phone, doing all of these things. There was a Belgian politician, uh, Raoul, I can't, I can't remember his uh, last name off the top of my head. He was saying that. He was saying all of these accusations don't come with any evidence. But then when the U.S., we find out the U.S. is spying on our leaders, we just say to them, oh, we're sorry, we'll speak slower next time so you can hear clearly everything we said. Um, so I think it, that is also the story of losing hegemony. It might not be so much that they're afraid Chinese, the Chinese will spy on their allies. It's that, that they lose the... Places. They, yeah, yeah they are they're censored yeah yeah they're censored by the, the, i mean the the, the um, atlantic council helps them censor people off that say things that are inconvenient to to uh, uh, uh american foreign policy when when uh Soleimani was killed and people were pointing out that he was on his on his way to a peace mission or any of these additional pieces of context people were removed and these platforms came out with official statements saying that anybody who is empathetic towards the iranian regime will be removed off of our platforms and so to imagine that now there's a new social media app like tiktok that so many people are using that maybe they won't 
won't have that level of control over. I think that's what's scaring them. So again, it goes back to hegemony. This is the big threat that China uh, poses to America. Now, uh, Daniel, we've run out of time. So tell people how they can follow your work. Uh, I know, but I'd like you to tell them. Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm on YouTube just under my name, Daniel Dumbrell, and also on Twitter. I don't really post anywhere else. Um, but yeah, I'm just on those two platforms for the time being. Well, I urge everyone to follow you right now because you'll be grateful to me for that advice. Daniel Dumbrell, thank you for joining us on the mother of Thanks very much. talk shows.